This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning and welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve. We are currently at Karagari Dam. There's a little hippo in the dam and it is cloudy here. So our plan for this morning, we came here just to check if the buffaloes were still there, but we will be reporting live from all our locations this morning, which is great. Hopefully we'll get you some great action. So please jump on board to your very own live safari from the African wild. still sitting at Gary Dam. As you can see, there's a slight rain happening here. It is quite cloudy and this hippo probably came back from a long walk after feeding last night. Yesterday, af well, yesterday afternoon we saw a big herd of buffalo here, so I will check around here if there's anything happening. My name is Cedric and I have Morgan on camera with me this morning. So yeah, we'll check around what we can see here, otherwise we'll continue. Apparently Dark Main was heard not too far from here, so can be lucky and found it. So in the meantime, we'll look around. I hope that the buffalo didn't walk too far from here, but you never know. Um, I think the last report I got, they were heading towards Central Road in the block there. So please also don't forget to send us your question. We'd love to hear from you. And you can do it, as you know, on hashtag Wildlife on Twitter at FC on YouTube. If you are under the age of 18, pop us a mail on kidsquestion at wildlife.tv. You can also register on our website, head over to the live safari page, and you can submit your question there. Yeah, I started the show yesterday as well in the same spot. <laughs> so if I have to start the show tomorrow, I will try to find another spot. But it was always good to come check here, um, because we Apparently dark main was around here, the buffalo was around here, so it's a good way to start. But for the moment we don't hear much. I think what we're going to do now is start moving and drive towards Central Road there and see if we can't find any tracks of the buffaloes or anything there. Ah, it is nice to be out again this morning. Um, yesterday it was a bit quiet on Juma, but we did get some nice sighting of buffaloes, great birding yesterday as well, also some elephants. So hopefully this morning we can find some cats, that would be nice. So it is a bit cloudy here, but let's see what is the weather at all our locations. It is very cloudy indeed today. There's a lot of moisture up in the air and you can see the elephant has a perfect line across its back of where it was last submerged in the water, but it's looking overall quite dark and I'm sure because of all the droplets that are floating about. My name is Ali and on camera with me today is Darren and we are very happy to be taking a bumble. Um, yeah, it's not a bad way to start in the morning with some elephants. Seems like it's quite a small herd. We haven't heard or seen any more elephants around. So just to see two of them is a little bit on the rarer side because it would normally be the mum, the youngster, and then another one. But I suspect something could have happened to the smaller calf because um, there's no little one around. Sometimes it does happen. She does look pregnant. Uh, so very likely there's one on the way. And they've just carried on about their day as we bumped into them. They've just been feeding on 
some grass and some branches of trees uh, really she actually even kind of pushed down a whole tree and then thankfully the tree the tree sprung back up so if you ever driving around in the wild and then you see certain trees that are leaning in a funny direction not always the wind <laughs> elephants also have a way of <laughs> reshaping the environment around us it's also one of the reason why they call them ecosystem engineers they're looking pretty, almost like sleepy this morning. I think it's, you know, when the weather is like this and you just want to stay tucked in bed. I think it's pretty much the same for they. They just take it at an easier pace. And she's been eating a bunch of different things. I don't think she's found anything that's quite to her taste because she's gone from the grass to a semi-dead acacia tree to the branches of some bush willows. And I think now she's onto more grass. Who knows, maybe the buffet around here is just not good enough. I suspect she'll... Oh, are you going to break that little tree? Oh, you see how she wrapped her trunk and her tusk around it? And then she pushed forward. There we go. And then she created tension that way, and then she managed to pull it off. Judy, I agree. It's such a pleasure to start pleasure to start the day with elephants. They, we haven't seen, well, I know Cedric had some of them yesterday. I haven't seen too many elephants since I've returned to Juma. So it's actually quite wonderful to be able to spend some time with them. They are very interesting animals to, to watch. I would say, you know, we always have the competition, you know, which one's more interesting, lion or a leopard. You know, it's, it's the, endless, um, the endless game. But with elephants... I think you always have a better chance of catching them doing something, more so than lions or leopards, because, you know, if they're in a herd, then the little ones are around, they're playing, they're always eating, there's always something to talk about, or it's always something that you can see when they're doing things. And then as long as you can read their behavior, then they're actually perfectly safe to to watch. In this case, when you guys saw her put up her trunk, she was smelling, she was sniffing for something. I don't think necessarily us. Maybe she's picking up something in the weather. Maybe the rest of the herd of elephants is further away. And she's just walking a little bit slower. Maybe she got a whiff of, you know, one of the cats that we're looking for. But nothing that really bothered her all that much. And I think that bush willow must be the treat of the day because she has not stopped eating it. So you see they've got their molars right back up at their mouth, so not in the front like what we would do. And then that's where she's chewing. And it's quite funny, it's almost, I don't know, almost like eating a hot dog sideways or a corn of cub, like in the movies where it goes one in, in one side and then it comes out the other side clean, like the cartoons used to display. Who knows, maybe they got inspiration from watching African elephants eat. I'm sure these guys are waiting for the rainy season because as soon as it comes, especially I'm sure you've seen around, there are a lot of fire breaks that have been burnt, a lot of burnt areas. Um, as soon as the first rains come, and even sometimes if the weather, if there's enough condensation, then you'll see brand new shoots of grass and then all the creatures, the elephants, the zebras, the wildebeest, the buffalo, they love going into those areas because then it's much more palatable um, than everything we're looking at here. Everything's... Well, we're coming to the end of the dry season, so the <laughs> the options are starting to become limited, and I suspect they also taste dustier than what they did <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Now, now she's going in front of the branch with... Oh. <laughs> I'm sure she did not intend for that to happen. And then there's revenge of the elephant. <laughs> Getting smacked in the face and then just eating the, the bark. So this time of the year, you'll see they eat a lot of bark of different trees. We have seen marulas and nopthorns. They get targeted. There are two prominent species of trees around here. They get targeted a lot. The elephants are going for, not for the outer bark, which is the dead part of the tree. And it's got actually no very little nutrients but they're after the layer that is underneath that dead uh, bark because that's got all the nutrients the new line mail from um, the Kruger, the Kruger mail just passes about 50 meters from us to the, the north of our camp moving in the direction of Kruger's dam you could see one female was there mm -hmm. 
happening? Uh, there's a moon coming from the singer. Sorry, I'm just trying to catch an update on the radio. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't see them anymore. Uh, they walked, you know, past, past our camp, past our house, in the direction of Kubish's dam. Okay, okay. there okay. seems like the Kruger males are around the area, but they're a little bit too far and in an area where we unfortunately won't get signal. But it's good to hear that they've been coming in and out, and hopefully we'll get more more lions all around us i'm gonna leave our beautiful girl and we're just gonna carry on see if maybe we can catch up with dark mane somewhere around this area but in the meantime we'll send you guys across to yappy who would like to say good morning good morning and welcome to and beyond Angala, where this morning we are setting out to go look for anything we can find really. We had a early morning drizzle, which is actually quite nice. The dust has settled a little bit. And it's also not that cold because of that. The cloud cover is providing a little bit of insulation. So we're gonna head up to the eastern part of the reserves, or to the reserve and see if we might pick up on any tracks of um, a pack of wild dogs that's been in the area yesterday. Now. I'm Yapi. Behind the camera, we've got Yuan, and we'll make our way around the watering holes in the eastern part of the reserve. And I'm pretty sure we might find something good this morning. Now, the first thing in the morning, the best thing to do and start with is always driving near or in the Timbavati riverbed. There's always a lot happening near the river and because of this little bit of rain now, we'll start to see a lot of movement as soon as the, starts, the clouds start to clear a little bit later on. But it's actually crazy that we're having a little bit of rain this early already. Normally our rains is only set to start around October. Although I guess it's not completely uncommon. Now, we had a lot of rain at the beginning of the year and we thought that we'd never see that green grass and all that tall grasses disappear. But the animals have done a pretty good job in cropping them down and opening up the spaces in this side. Now, the interesting thing about that is that because we have standing watering holes or man-made watering holes, that does attract a lot of animals in these parts. And that's why the areas nearby, and even this area that we are, even though it's close to the big river, you can see some greenery there indicating the, the tree line on the river's edge. But that also means that the animals stay within this area, certain animals, Impala, the zebra, the wildebeest. And we've recently started seeing large herds of buffalo come in and out of the area. So I think this year, going forward, we'll probably have quite a lot of rain towards the end of the year. So we're gonna continue along the river's edge and see what we can find. Is that rain in the distance? Oh, I think we might have some rain in the distance. Just all the way in front of us, going down and then all the way up towards the direction of the Kruger. So I think I'm actually going to take the first road and turn around and go somewhere else. Um, I, uh, okay. So I got the, I got a bit of the. Oh, that is a lion track. Let's go back. Pretty sure. 
And they're not too far, so maybe the lions. I know Cedric is where, with the pride of lions. I'm um, sorry, with the buffalo herd. And we've now got tracks heading okay. that way. Thank you. Can I come and join you? I think he's actually a little bit further, but let's just. Hi, there's the lions! <laughs> Look at them there! <laughs> I mean, who knew they are sitting out in the open and we find them first by looking at their tracks. <laughs> okay, hi guys. Just gonna have to put this on the radio. Um, stations located at and Gala on the fire break, just south of the junction with Gallagher. Well, hello. We've been desperately looking for you guys. And the buffalo are not far away and the weather is perfect. So hopefully we'll see some action. I mean, just let's not get too... And they're slowly moving and they're all very quiet. Except this boy here at the back. So let's just try and follow them for a little bit, see what they get up to. As we were discussing yesterday, the weather affects the animals' movements quite a lot in what they do. And because today the weather is not great for us, as humans, because we don't love it, um, it's actually very good for them to carry on moving. It would have been so easy to drive past them. Their tawny coats actually camouflage incredibly well at this time of the year. This is one of those funny finds. For having <laughs> our nose stuck into the ground looking for tracks, we almost miss the actual animal. It does happen sometimes. <laughs> I don't think the people that taught me to track would be too impressed with that move. <laughs> but at least, you know, I still pass the assessment. <laughs> just carry on forth. I just want to make sure that people heard me. So if, I know everyone's been looking for prides of lions um, the last couple of days and the radio has been a little bit on and off. Did anyone copy about the Schlambi and Gala? Um, no negative. Uh, Ali, where is that? Um, I've just found them, they're slowly mobile east, they're just east of, um, they're on the fire break, just east of Galago Shortcut, Buffalo Pipeline. Copy, um, I'm going to come up and join you there if I can, Ellie. Copy, more than welcome to, they're all walking now on the fire break. Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering if there are some coming on their way here, taking a bath. Okay, copy. Alright. There's, well, I suspect these are the Talamatis. It's the pride of lions that we've been seeing around this particular spot of the property for sort of the last couple of months. Um, I know, oh, what is that running there? Some impala perhaps in the far away distance. They're not too worried because they're still a little bit too far and then they've just run across. So we're going to stick around. Oh, I can hear the Impala alarm calling. But like I said, these are not their target. And I know Cedric is not too far away with the buffalo herd. So we're going to stick around here and then just see you what the lions get up to. But let's get over to Damien, who would also like to say good morning. Morning from Anbian Pinder Private Game Reserve. We've come out into the open grasslands on the far southwest of the reserve in search of a pride of lions. And along the way, we came across this absolutely magnificent scene. A group of giraffe busy walking along a ridge line, feeding slowly as they go. My name's Damon, behind the camera this morning is Owen. And we're very excited to come and search for this pride of lions. Apparently last night they were seen somewhere down in the valley off to our left. Um, and so we actually came here to stop and scan using our, or use our binoculars to see if we can try and spot the lions. 
uh, from where, somewhere near to where they were left last night. Oh, look at that giraffe on the left, everybody. Look, do you see it? It just bent down and picked something up. I don't know how... Oh, there's a young male busy sniffing her rear end. No doubt testing to see if she's an estrus. But the giraffe on the far left, the female, look at how she's now walking, kind of holding her head high. I don't know if you can see her mouth. It's a jar and it looks like she's rolling a jawbreaker around in her mouth. She's picked up a bone. And I'm sure that some of you would have seen this kind of behavior before from giraffes. So they pick up bones and then chew on them or roll them around in their mouths. Just to get that extra bit of those extra minerals in their diet, phosphorus, and calcium. See, both of these young male giraffe are quite interested in her. They keep going towards her rear end and sniffing there. Like we said, no doubt checking to see if she's if she's coming into estrus. And they want, wanting to smell her. Oh, look at the <laughs> female with the, the bone in her mouth. She keeps throwing her head around. Trying to get that bone across her or keep it in her mouth without swallowing it. But also trying to roll it around so that she can try and get the maximum amount of minerals from it. Obviously, I'm not too interested in the attentions of of the male who's following her. See how he's not really that he's a pretty similar size to her, so that's why I'm saying he's still quite a young male. A big mature male would be quite a bit, well, yeah, noticeably bigger than her. Have a look at his horns, they're still quite thin. Haven't quite developed the, the very pronounced bald patch on the top. But he seems to be hopeful. There's the bone sticking out of her mouth, did you see that? And now he's even rubbing his head against the side of her of her back legs. But yeah, she couldn't look less interested. She's just content to have her... I couldn't see if it was a rib bone or... It looked like quite a, quite a, quite a, thin, a thin bone or quite a long bone. So maybe a... Maybe a, um, maybe a broken off rib. She's walking with her, like holding her head high. It's almost like she's turning her nose up at him and walking away. <laughs> I'm not interested in you. But no, obviously, it's just purely based on her behavior with the bone. It's always just so special to see giraffe in open areas. And especially when they've got, when they're up on a ridge like this. And you can see them silhouetted against the sky. So just while we've been sitting here, I've been using my binoculars and scanning. And obviously that's something that these giraffe would be doing as they walk with those long necks, using their height advantage and their really good eyesight to scan for potential danger. And off to the left, I've managed to spot the lions we're looking for. They're all resting in an open clearing quite far away from here. So I don't know if we'll be able to show you them with the camera for now, but we'll definitely head down there. Here we go, Owen's gonna give it a go. <laughs> right, so down there in the bottom of the valley, can you see those two prominent gray trees? And there's a patch of earth there. Yep, Owen knew exactly where to go. There are the lions lying in the open. That's super exciting. So we're gonna leave the giraffe now with them slowly kind of making their way along the ridge line, we're gonna go see if we can't get uh, a better view of those lines for you.
nominated to the top five and finally being here. For me, that's it's an achievement. Tracks, I believe I did quite well, and the walk. And sometimes you often drag their feet forward. The storytelling as well. So yeah, I think um, that's where I see my strongest point. And then, that was the opportunity of the scrappy. I say the bedding and the call definitely for me. <laughs> It was quite a big challenge. Guiding is not all about the award that we have had, but in sharing the experience and continue to do what we have passion and love. Um, something very, very interesting. I didn't plan this, but this is a scene, a rarely seen. This is what we call a journey of giraffe. So beautiful. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Ah, oh, look at that. How cute is that? So we found this very small herd of elephant and there's one young one currently cycling. You can see also they are currently in a dry riverbed, but they can still dig into the sand and find water underneath the sand. You can see there the mother cleaning the water. You can see that water is a bit muddy, but how cool is that? Basically, this young elephant is lying down and circling from underneath, obviously. So it is a better start this morning. Um, on our side, we did find the buffaloes. We're currently moving east from Karikat line, but there's no signal, unfortunately, there. So what we are doing is looking around the eastern part of Juma, and hopefully the Buffaloes will move a bit further from that area, but we can see them. Very nice that Ailey also found some lions. So what that mother is doing now, she's removing the dirty water on top to get to the clean water. Obviously they will use their trunk to bring the water to their mouth. But we can see now the water is getting a bit cleaner and cleaner. I see only three elephants though. I'm not sure if there's more a bit further ahead, but it looks like a very small herd. You can see the trunk on the young one going on the forehead there. Obviously they don't use their trunk when they circle. Gregory, indeed, I agree with you. You're saying what an amazing scene, yes. Is that often you see a uh, young elephant circling like that, especially in that position, because it is already quite big. So it's currently lying down in the sand and getting some milk there. Obviously the elephant are the only mammal except for the primates who have a memory gland between the front legs. For the antelopes it will be between the back legs, well next to the belly, but for the elephant it is between the front leg. Very thirsty. I'm not sure how much milk we can drink actually, but this one seems to be very, very thirsty. Patients with lipid is eight miles in 
Sorry about that. It's quite nice to have a setting, but there's a few things happening happening at the same time. This cow is cleaning the water to get some water. The young is drinking milk. Very nice. Okay, so we will sit here and see what happens. If they move off, we will move off as well. In the meantime, we'll send you to Ali with the lions. <laughs> well, <laughs> after I got very excited that the lions were moving and that the weather conditions were perfect, some of them may not have agreed with my statements. Seems, um, well, they've probably been walking quite a fair distance overnight because they were in Manileti um, yesterday, not too sure how far in. But now they've just gone, come all the way back. And as I said, Cedric had a buffalo herd not too far, so I have a suspicion that these guys might just be trailing the buffalo. It can be a long affair, but good thing is the day is just starting and we've got this drive and another drive so many things can happen even if they take a casual nap for the time being um, I've counted around and I think we've got seven adult lions if I'm not mistaken because from where we've repositioned to park then we've seen a few more but then they keep moving so it's hard to count them when there are a lot of trees in the way but potentially seven or eight of them are around here Two young boys is what I can see, and I also saw the old female, or what seems to be like the old older female around here. And I think they had all the intentions of going hunting, because when we first bumped into them and you saw they got up and started moving, but then the impala started pretty much making a racket when they saw them, so there was a lot of alarm, <laughs> the way that they go, and it was incessant. Okay, I see some more lions moving, so we may have eight, nine. Oh, are you guys all here? So we've got four that are in the open, and I can see one, two, three, four more that are slowly going to start coming into our screen because they've just decided now to get up and moving. So hopefully they'll come and greet these guys. It's always wonderful when lions... They get this, it's almost like a separation anxiety. And when they meet again and then they greet, just to reinforce their, their bonds as a family, then there's always this head rubbing and it's, it's quite beautiful to watch. There's a vehicle approaching that she's looking at. As I know, it's um, a lot of people have been looking for, for a pride of lions the last couple of days. And I wonder where Darkmane is. He's not, I'm sure he's not too far and maybe he got lucky and then he pulled them back with his drawing because Darren mentioned he heard them roar last night. I was apparently too fast asleep to hear them, so. Oh, it is starting to rain a little bit. Getting a bit of a drizzle now. Not too bad. We're ready. We got lions. Not that they seem too bothered and they seem they've had a meal of sorts because none of them are looking too skinny. I mean, at least this boy. Oh, Eon. At least this boy doesn't. So yeah, it seems like overall eight lions. Can't count more of them. And it's quite interesting. Uh, oh, they might just do a walk by, by us. Guys, you look tired. Nine lions in total. Oh, seems like today might be a good cat day, so let's head over to Damien, who's also had some cat luck. From a pride of lions at Juma to a pride of lions at Ambion Pinda. We've managed to get closer to that pride of lions that we spotted from the top of the hill. And as luck would have it, they're lying in the middle of the road. So have a look on the left of the screen. See the probably the biggest lion in your screen is that adult lioness on the left. 
lying very sphinx-like, looking towards the rising sun. Oh, the sun is about to come out of the clouds and it's going to bathe these lions in the most glorious light. And then just to the right of her is a, a sub-adult female, young female. I don't know if you can hear that snorting sound in the background. I'm going to keep quiet for a second. Of course, he's gone quiet now. There's a wildebeest bull that's up on the hillside to our left that's busy, busy alarm calling at these lines. But yeah, so behind, behind the young lioness is her brother, a young male. Look at the, the tufts of hair starting to grow down the back of his neck and around his cheeks. Starting to grow a bit of a mane. And then to the right of him is another, another young male. Julia, you remarking that more lions for the morning. It certainly sounds like Ali's had quite a bit of luck over there at Juma with some lions. And yeah, like she said, it seems like it's gonna be a lion-filled morning. There we go, the sun has come through and look at that glorious light. The young female in front of us, look how she's starting to groom the underside of her paw there. cleaning bits of dirt out from in between her toes. Now onto the back paw. Have a look at those spots on the backs of her on the backs of her or the back of her legs there, as well as on the legs of the young male behind her. And compared to the lioness to their left possibly their mother, and see how her spots on the back of her legs are quite faded, so an indication of age. Of course, the lions, when they're born, they're covered in little spots to help them camouflage in their den site, and then as they get older, those spots fade away. And then depending on the genes of the lion, the area that they're from originally, The spots might fade completely and disappear, or they might still stick around, or they might still be visible throughout the lion's life. Oh, that young male has just flopped over onto his side. And look at his, look at the little, the little male on the far right. He's lying with his with his chin almost in between his paws. How cute is that? <laughs> it's like he doesn't want to move. He's got his little spot and he doesn't want to move too much. There's been quite a bit of fog or mist hanging in the air, so the ground is quite wet. And it's almost like he doesn't, he's got his little dry patch that he's, his body has made, he's obviously been transferring all of his body heat onto the ground, and now he doesn't want to move from that spot. It's quite a, quite a chilly morning, and with the cooler temperatures, just looking at the lioness, sorry, I didn't mention, there was a lioness that walked right past us a bit earlier. And she was lying with the rest of the the rest of the lions. She's now lying behind us, keeping an eye on us. Um, I think just with watching her when she walked past us, looking at her belly, we were just discussing how she had quite a prominent fold of skin under her tummy. And some of you may have seen that fold of skin on lions before. Some of you may have seen the lion that's that's gorged itself before when it's eaten, and it looks like it's sort of a, a beach ball. And that fold of skin is, of course, there to help accommodate the, the expanding of the belly. And if you can see that fold of skin, it's normally an indication that the lion's tummy is relatively empty and that it might be hungry. So the lioness who walked past us, she had quite a noticeable little fold of skin. So she hasn't eaten in a bit. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same with these other lions here. So maybe with the cool of the morning, these lions start to move around to try and hunt. Bianca, you're asking how many lion prides we have on Pinda. Bianca, we have three. So there's this pride, which 
live kind of in the far south and the west of the reserve, basically everywhere south of the Ubombo Mountains. Those mountains you can see in the background there. And most of their habit or most of their territory looks much like this around us here, open grassland. Then there's a pride kind of in the central parts of the reserve, the area around Mountain Lodge, into the mountains of the west, and even up onto the um, the, the plains slightly further. Oh, lioness coming right past us, Eddie. Sorry, everybody, the lioness has just stood up and she's walking again past us. Here she comes. Could you hear that? She just gave a very soft little contact call. And this is the one earlier that I said there seemed to be a little bit of a fold of skin under her belly. She definitely seems to be a lot more restless than the other lions. It'll be interesting to see if the other ones are as empty belly as she is. See, there's that fold. Because maybe, well, we'll see. I mean, it's possible that the others have eaten and she hasn't. Maybe she didn't get anything from, from their most recent kill. But sorry, to continue answering your question, Bianca, the, there's another, yeah, like I said, another pride of lionesses that lives kind of in the central parts of the reserve. Most of their habitat is kind of mountainous woodland, uh, a couple of open grassy um, plain sit-like sections. And then in the far north of the reserve, there's a third pride. And they've got quite a, a varied territory. Their territory encompasses open grassland, sandfelt woodland, and sand forest. Yeah, so this is the pride that's in the far, the far south and the far west of the reserve, south of the Ubombo Mountains. The pride that we often call the, well, we, the, the pride that we refer to as the Biola Pride. And there is, we can see five lions in front of us here. There is another youngster that I'm sure is somewhere nearby, as well as another lioness. Um, and then of course the big male, who was apparently seen further west from here last night. But Owen and I are definitely gonna spend a bit more time here with these lions and see what they get up to. left our elephants bumbling around now We're making our way to Befelshuk Dam to see if there's anything there and it did start to rain a bit so but it's not too strong so it's still okay obviously in summer we can get much more rain than that now it's just a little drizzle Which is quite nice as well for the predators. They might be active a bit longer today. I was not really expecting rain today. <laughs> Sorry, this road is a little bit bumpy. I think what we will do now, check Buffalo Shook down, then drive towards Buffalo shoot cut line and then Chita cut line to do quite a loop around the property. But hopefully there will be something at Buffalo shoot dam. I haven't been very lucky on that dam in the past, except for a nice hippo sighting. But it's good to check again. I didn't see any trucks or anything. Every time I come here, I hope seeing lions lying on the, the wall, but no. There's a nice sunrise, which is very pretty here.
You can see there's one hippo, I think. Yeah. There we go. Good morning and welcome to Wild Earth. We live at Eco Training Spridens and we're busy viewing some zebras that just came in for a drink. It's an absolutely stunning morning. Temperatures is nice and cool. There was a little bit of drizzle earlier on this morning and we almost thought that it's going to provide us with a little bit of trouble for the day in terms of being able to get out there. However, these conditions are perfect for walking. So my name is JP LaRue and behind the camera we've got Harrod. I'm going to sit and enjoy my cup of coffee and the view on these zebras and tell you a little bit more about them. A species that we have over here is known as a plain zebra. Sorry, and then for those of you that are quite keen on the Mara expedition, we'll see their very close relative, a subspecies in East Africa, which is known as a virtual zebra. Traditionally, this one was also incorrectly referred to as a virtual zebra. For those of you that are interested in what is a subspecies, a subspecies is basically a population that became separated over time. So if you become separated over time and geographically isolated from one another, you start developing the individual characteristics which separates you from that other population. And eventually, sometimes we'll find that that group will become so distinct that they'll become a species on their own. Just a few of the differences between the East African virtual zebra population and the plain zebra population is that the plain zebras has got a black line on top of a white section, which we refer to as a gridiron pattern, which a virtual zebra does not have. I'm absolutely amazed. We're quite late in the winter. The grass conditions isn't great, but these animals are in impeccable condition. And if you have a look at their manes, you'll actually notice that they're still in an upright position. If a zebra is not healthy and its fat reserves are dwindling, it generally starts flopping. You can use that same characteristic to assess the health of a horse by simply looking at the mane. But quite often with the zebras, there's a few of the mares lately that are pregnant, but some of the males are also so often bloated that they also appear pregnant from all these coarse grasses that they eat. And you have to really carefully look between the legs to make sure that it's a male and not a female. One of the easiest ways, if you can't see the tools, is simply looking between the buttocks if they're walking away. If it's got a narrow little black line, in this case the male is wearing the G-string, that is then obviously male. And if it's got a big broad line, which I always call the boxes, it's for females that's wearing the boxes in this case. We're going to enjoy our cup of coffee and the surrounding views on the dam for a little bit longer and then we're going to start moving out. Let's go and see what Yarpi is up to. And on this side we have two beautiful impala rams busy feeding. see the head up and they're listening around I can see the other one's looking off to the left a little bit and I can hear some gray go away birds alarming at something there well, it could have been anything really and as you can see these impalas don't seem too well wow, that's amazing <laughs> it's more than two I wanted to say it had to be a little larger than only a group of two Right on the edge, you can see behind those animals, it's starting to get a little bit denser. And you can see the green leaves of the magic quarries in and amongst them. So usually on the edges of the clearings near the riverbeds, that's where we find the impalas, especially the male impalas at the moment. You 
somewhere far off in the distance is the low sound of a lion roaring. And it's not really affecting these impalas too much. You can see they are paying attention. That one's ears going around. Now something's drawn its attention. See that one impala grooming its backside a little bit. Now, after this little bit of rain we've had this morning, there would be a lot of flying insects, and I'm pretty sure also a couple of ticks that might come of the grasses. So there will be a lot of grooming over the next day or so from these impalas. But what a beautiful area! It's not too far from a dry riverbed. See that massive weeping bourbon there. And what a beautiful tree indeed. You can see the leaf cover is a little bit sparse. And it's probably about to relieve. Jack, I think if I got your question correctly, what are the best features about a impala when it is expecting a predator well they do have excellent sense of hearing and a good sense of smell the, se the fact that they're together as well which is what we're seeing here also aids them so there's always one with its head up mostly looking out for himself but the benefit of being together means that at any given point at least one of them would do that and then of course they've got the camouflage as well you can see there's a lot of scratching and grooming on going on behind the ears the tough to reach areas utilize this little bit of wetness we had this morning for this softer little bit of green that's in between Leslie what antelopes do we see on Gala we have quite a wide variety and this part of the Lofeld is a wide variety in general but we the most numerous will more than likely be the Impala and then we also see quite a lot of wildebeest. We see waterbuck. And lately, now that it's not as dense anymore, we've been seeing a lot of doker, common doker, or steenbok as well. In fact, the other day I saw a steenbok drinking, which is something that's quite rare. It's not something that I've ever seen before, actually. And they're usually quite water independent occasionally we'll have the more fancy antelopes walk into the reserve like sable I don't know of any own that's been recorded here or eland but at least in my time here I have not seen any of those and see there's also some what looks like some ringneck doves Cape turtle doves. We usually find them in pairs like this early mornings, either on the road or an open spot like this. It's easy for them to pick up whatever little seeds they can find. While we, I think we might leave this very peaceful scene here near the banks of the Timbavati and continue along to a watering hole to see if anything might come down to come and have a drink.
Every year in August, South Africa marks Women's Month. Wild Earth would like to acknowledge and thank all the amazing females who have worked tirelessly to share our nature with the world. We're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to just wait, okay? She's gonna come out there just on my right hand side and she can see these impala. Now you've got to inhale it. It burns! I don't know if it's supposed to work instantly. Go girl, go, get her! Get her girl, get her! <laughs> I'm so looking to following her story in the future. I'm really hoping there's two. I'm really, really hoping there's two, but you know, even if there's one. Oh, oh my goodness, everyone. <gasps> and I get to share it with you. Isn't that extra special? I get to experience it and show it to everyone. We got there, he had probably moved a couple hundred meters down the river and it was about 10 meters from this causeway. So I radioed the lodge quickly and just asked them to bring a land cruiser around and some tow straps. So we thought we were going to try to be, be heroes and save this, save this giraffe. And now a big bull, probably you know, over a ton, he's a, he's a big unit. We got the tow strap one side of the giraffe and managed to get it around him with the boat and the other edge of the tow strap obviously back onto the bank. So we made this U around him because he was lying quite close to the bank and um, yeah we, we put that land cruise in low range and we just gave it hell and pulled that giraffe and the, the toe strap slipped up and we thought oh no you know it's going to slip off the top of the head and it caught on his, his Aussie cones top and that last 10 meters pulled him out onto the bank and he, he battled he was obviously quite weak and all that. This is a battle of two great carnivores of the African wilderness. Whew. Whoa! You don't want to be under those jaws. Definitely, this round goes to the lion. Look at that. Fantastic. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. Owen and I are still sitting with this pride of lions and shame that other adult lioness has been pacing up and down quite restlessly and she's been contact calling quite a bit. Remember I said that there was one of the youngsters that was missing we couldn't see. There's that small or well, the smallest youngster there on the screen, the one on the far right and further back. Now that youngster has a male sibling that we haven't seen since we arrived here. And the direction that the lioness has been walking in is kind of back towards where the lion pride was left last night. So it might be that, excuse me, this, this missing cub has maybe been left behind. It might be that it was left behind on a smaller carcass that it managed to get a larger piece of and kind of took it off to feed on it by itself but the lioness seems to be quite restless. She's, like I said, she's been contact calling, she's been pacing up and down. She comes back to the lion, the, oh, the rest of her family here, and kind of rubs her head against their head and then, and then moves off again, almost like she's trying to rally them, trying to get them to get up and go, come and help her find her missing little one. And she, she almost managed to, to, get, uh, to get them going. Yeah, the adult lioness started to yawn and groom herself, but once the once the lioness, had, well, once the restless lioness had moved off, she kind of lay back down again. The subadult female also, for a moment, stood up and followed followed the restless lioness, but now has turned around to come and lie back down in the middle of the road. So, Sham, it seems like that like the mother is going to be on her own on her mission to go back and find the little one. I'm sure it's fine. It's probably just been, like we said, left behind on a, on a piece of meat or something. Maybe it chased something and got separated from the rest of the pride. And like we said, that lioness was contact calling, making this, this little contact call.
giraffe girl, you're asking how old the older cubs are from this litter are. Giraffe girl, if I'm not mistaken, they were born around April last year. Or kind of, yeah, midway through more or less middle of last year. So they're a little bit over a year old. And already, look at that mane that's starting to develop on here, on this young male. It's only a mohawk and a bit of fluff around his cheeks for now, but it's quite an impressive, quite an impressive little start of a mane. And of course that comes from, from the genes that, that he's, that his, his bloodline carries from his, from his father. Many of you would have seen the dominant male lion, or the, the remaining dominant male lion from the southern parts of the reserve, and just how beautiful and big his mane is, super long and dark, really full, kind of sweeps over his back between his shoulder blades and down in between his front legs and big tufts on his elbows. He's got a really, really impressive mane. So it seems that that, that, that gene is carrying through to, or has carried through to his offspring. Yes, we're talking about the how this lioness is going to go about finding her little one. I said she was contact calling, so as she's walking, she'll be making those little soft. Well, to our ears, they sound soft. We were just discussing how, even though the sound is soft, it's a really powerful sound. You feel that sound kind of punching you in the chest every time she makes it. And it's quite a bit of a bit of the sound that is below our range of hearing, and that. Even though it's very soft, the sound will travel quite far. So that cub should be able to hear her calling and then respond to her. And I'm sure it's going to be overjoyed to see her. Come running up to her. Rub up against her. Oh, and if she brings it back here yeah, to the rest of the family, it's going to be super, super fun to watch. A big family reunion. I've just been watching though this adult lioness though. She's been looking still, she's still got that kind of like sphinx pose like we were talking about earlier. And she's still staring off to the right and even the young, the older young male is looking in that direction too. And there's quite a couple of herds of impala, one or two wildebeest on the other side of the ravine. I think a bit far for them to attempt to hunt from here because there's, there's not much cover between them and the prey species. But yeah, I think I, mean, I might just turn around and go and see if we can follow that lioness to see um, if she can find her little one, because I think that'll be quite fun to watch. Uh, but while we debate as to whether we're going to stay here or go look for the other lioness, let's go across to Ngala where Yapi has found a bird in a tree. Here we have a regular visitor to this particular area. A pale Walbix eagle. Now, we've recently started seeing Walbix eagles back in the area. I've only seen a couple, but I've noticed the other day that this pair, which comes here regularly, this is at least the third year now that I've seen them here. And what a beautiful bird indeed. The mate of this one is a dark brown one, and then this one is a, a much paler morph. You can see the chest and the head. A good spot to be sitting early morning scope the area out see he's looking in all different directions to try and see if there might be anything nearby but it's also got its feathers kind of puffed up no, 
trying to insulate itself or maybe dry out a little bit. It's sitting with its backside towards the direction where the sun would be. a nest in one of these trees nearby. What's interesting with the Warburg's eagle is they do come back often to use the same the same nest and I've seen them in the past where even the offspring of a pair would come back and use a nest in a similar area. Not too far away from a watering hole. I got that name correctly, Corn Husker. We have some really big Wahlberg's birds here. I'd say this looks like a pretty regular sized Wahlberg's eagle to me. It's just puffed up a little bit and the feathers are slightly raised and it looks a little bit stockier than it usually does. See now it's starting to groom a little bit. Well, so why we have a look at this eagle and continue watching it, we'll go over to a clip of an upcoming expedition in the Mara. The Masai Mara in Kenya is an iconic wilderness filled with life. Its inspirational beauty has captivated our hearts on Wild Earth for many years. While this season of the world's greatest migration has been missed, Wild Earth is preparing a spectacular comeback in 2022. For the first time ever, Wild Earth will be running expeditions to Kenya's Masai Mara throughout the 2022 migration season. Hosted by David Githu and Isaac Rottich, you could be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration with the world, live on Wild Earth's daily safaris. If you're interested, then head over to our website to find out more. Well, we had to take a bit of a detour. Um, it started raining quite hard, so because we carry a lot of equipment and cables and electrical, I want to call them appliances, we then had to go back to camp to put the roof on and we've just sort of come back or to the area where the lions were last seen, but it seems like they've slowly been moving in this area over here. So this is a drainage line that runs straight onto Galago Pan and Galago Camp at Juma. And I think they've just sort of been around here. So obviously a bit tricky to maneuver around with a car, but there is someone on top of the drainage line there saying that they had about four of them and the rest were kind of moving this way. So I think we're just gonna have to wait for a little bit, see if maybe they come down this area. Cause I mean, it is, or we did see, I think 10 lions, it could be an 11th lion somewhere around, but because they're all spread out, then it's a little bit difficult. And then of course, the minute we went to camp to put the roof on because it started raining too hard, now it stops. As luck would have it. Okay, I'm gonna reverse myself out of this position. Go to, if I can start the car properly. And get to a bit of a higher ground. See if maybe we can see anything from here. As there are some 
some um, cars that are with them, but I think I'm actually gonna reverse in here. Oh, I don't know how to reverse all the way back. <sighs> it's the wonderful one million point turns in the bush. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're good now. It's much easier to try and look for holes when you're driving forward than driving backwards. Uh, Bianca, lions can move around a lot when it's raining, yeah. So I think most of it. So we've left that Wahlberg's Eagle and we are heading towards a watering hole to see if there might be something good here. Now, it's been very quiet in these parts this morning. I've seen some tracks, tracks of larger animals like elephants heading in this direction. And then I thought I heard some hippos in the distance earlier. looks very quiet. I can see some ripples in the water, so I know that there are hippos. And then there's also two Egyptian geese in the distance, looking like they might be having a standoff. But we'll sit here for a while and see if anything develops around this area. You're back with us at Ambient Pinda and Owen and I are still sitting with the pride of lions. And good news is that the, <laughs> the missing cub appeared out of the long grass <laughs> from the left hand side of the vehicle. So it has been lying here the whole time. There it is there, sitting with the, the, the bigger male, uh, the bigger sub-adult male. And <laughs> shame, the lioness went like walking off like we said presumably contact calling for the missing cub and suddenly the cub disappeared out of the grass lay down with its sibling and then mom came back she's not she's not calling anymore so i think that is well i mean it seems a bit odd that she didn't know that her own cub was close by but she stopped contact calling so whatever was causing her to contact call she seems to oh look she's busy digging there what is she Busy digging. He's maybe smelled something there. I wonder if there's in a small burrow. Or it's something interesting to roll in, that's what it is. Maybe an interesting scent. And the two all the cubs are watching her. Look at the cubs, they've all got their ears pinned back. Like they're gonna stalk her. She seems quite frisky as well. See how she's kind of like, she jumps up every now and then and then flicks her tail. I think she might also, she might also be inviting a game. Shame, she still seems to be desperate to try and get some kind of reaction from the rest of her family. She wants to get moving and they all just want to sleep. 
but I'm sure that all this wiggling around is going to... Oh, look, the cub is stalking her. There's going to be a big pounce here. Look, it's going to stalk her. <laughs> it's going to get close and then it's going to pounce on her. There they go. There they go. Big game. We're still with the lions here at Ambion Pinda and good news is that the lioness has come back from her little patrol and the missing cub is here too. And we've been watching how that restless lioness has finally managed to rouse a bit of a bit of life from the rest of her family and they're starting to move around a bit. The other adult lioness is on the move. So I'm sure now the rest of the pride is going to move to... Oh, this first going to be a, a big game, though. <laughs> See where all the lions are lying there? There was a... There's obviously something very interesting on the ground there because the adult lioness was rolling around there just, just a moment ago. So maybe an, an interesting smell. <laughs> but they're not even rolling, they're just lying down. Obviously in no hurry to get going. And of course the sub adult male, the last one to, to rise. And also the one with the fullest belly. Look at his tummy. But if both of the adult lionesses are standing and both of them are walking, obviously with them being the adults in the group here and knowing what's best and knowing where and when to go, They'll be the ones that decide when they start moving and the cubs will have no choice but to follow along. So if both lionesses are up and moving, there's a good chance the rest of the pride is going to move too. Ooh! That cub looking for trouble with one of the adults. Look, she's also digging now. The second lioness is digging on that same spot there. There's obviously an interesting smell there. That these lions are finding attractive to roll around in. Ooh, did you see that? It's like that cub put its claws into the lioness's foot. Shaman, there's even a bit of a, like a yowl of, of surprise or pain. Oh no. Adult lioness lying down again. Just as we thought that they were going to start moving. <laughs> Elsa, you're saying you're so excited to be with these lions right now. Elsa, there's something, there's just something about lions when it's nice and cool early in the morning, when the light is beautiful and they're actually doing something other than sleeping. So often, you know, if you find lions, because they spend so much of their day sleeping, there's a good chance if you find them that they will be doing that. But if they're starting to move around and they start to play and they start to look at each other, pounce on each other, and even just what they're doing now, that lioness in the far right, look at her and how she's looking up onto the hillside of the other side of the, of the little ravine here. So, you know, all these little subtle body language cues if they, 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 they're interested in something, it looks like. They, their ears are pricked forward and they're staring across the little, the little valley here. So all of these subtle little things are keeping us in hope that we're going to get to watch these lions move around. Because when lions move, I mean, they're these big massive predators that are super opportunistic with there being so many of them. And with their tummies being relatively empty, they'll be, they'll definitely, if they find an opportunity to hunt, they'll definitely take it. Or try to take it, at least. So all of those things make, make this quite an exciting, or a, a potentially exciting little scene. And that's why we are committing the time to, 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 
to these lions, to sit here with them and watch and see what they do. And all of that aside, I mean, look at the scenery. This has to be one of the most beautiful sections of the reserve for me at least, just with the rolling plains and the mountains in the background. Look at that. You never know what might come up out of this little ravine to our right. Like I said, it's quite a, quite a chilly morning and very often, um, I don't know how many of you have seen where warthogs rest at night, how they'll sleep in aardvark burrows. Uh, and then often when it's quite cold, presumably because of how little fur they've got on their bodies, you know, they're not as densely, f their, 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 their fur coat isn't as dense as something like a, like a lion or, a, or an anyala. And so they often only kind of come out on a cold morning, a little bit later in the morning when it's a bit warmer. And right about now is when we should start seeing warthogs coming out. This little ravine here will no doubt be full of burrows. So I'm sure that there's a couple of aardvark holes around, uh, aardvark holes around here that might have warthogs in them. And those warthogs should start to emerge, come out and start foraging. And that's something that these lions will be looking for to try and hunt. But alas, the lions have lain down again. I think that Owen and I are gonna try and reposition to try and get you a slightly better view of them. And while we do that, let's send you back to Yapi at a waterhole at Angala. This side things are very, very relaxed and quiet. You can see some hippos just following in the water. Just their eyes and their ears above the water and their nostrils. Have a little look up and see what's going around. talking about it to somebody the other day it is a very tricky thing to always judge exactly how many hippos there are within a watering hole with them or one of them at least holding their breath at any given time and often being under the water you yeah, can see all of them at the same time you see one or two come up you know, sometimes miss the fact that it's actually a different hippo coming up over here we've only had these few. Um, and they would have made their back their way back here early morning. With the early morning rains just before the sunlight came up. And during the night they were probably spending a lot of time in the nearby areas feeding. Look at that one hippo busy resting its head on the other one and it actually looks like a younger one and indeed it is which is very very interesting look at the Egyptian geese coming over some heavy disputes on the banks here of this watering hole in the last few days by those Egyptian geese. They make a lot of noise and now that they oh it's almost as if these hippos are relieved. Whitesha, is a hippo and a rhino skin similar? No, they're not similar. They're quite different. In fact, their rhino skin is much more... They're both quite sensitive in a way, but they, 
and they do protect it through various different ways. In terms of color, the rhinos got more of a gray skin and it's a very, very tough skin compared to the hippo smooth, almost purplish pink skin. The hippo skin is very susceptible to sunburn and also secretes an oil that helps to protect it from the sun. Where the rhino, rhino is a land animal, moving out on the land mostly, even though it does use a lot of mud to cool itself down. They both have very, very thick skins. Two different animals designed for two different environments. So the skins have developed a little bit different over time to to cater for their specific needs. The skin of the hippo being so sensitive to sunlight is part of why they come back into the water during the daytime, especially in this area where we don't have flowing water. So these hippos have to come back to these standing watering holes. And I think we'll probably leave these hippos in this watering hole and continue our search and see if we might pick up on something else further to the south of the reserve this morning. The Masai Mara in Kenya is an iconic wilderness filled with life. Its inspirational beauty has captivated our hearts on Wild Earth for many years. While this season of the world's greatest migration has been missed, Wild Earth is preparing a spectacular comeback in 2022. For the first time ever, Wild Earth will be running expeditions to Kenya's Masai Mara throughout the 2022 migration season. Hosted by David Githu and Isaac Rotich, you could be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration with the world, live on Wild Earth's daily safaris. If you're interested, then head over to our website to find out more. Scrabia collected a dry grass, put it next to the water hole. As the hippo walks down during the warm of the day to drink the water. When the hippo arrives, he saw quite a very nice grass, an area not to resist to rest. And when the hippo went down to drink the water, and when he finished the water, he just lied down. And then, that was the opportunity of the scribe. You know what? Today is my day <laughs> to pay the revenge. Looks like it's a very difficult climb because every time it tries to climb, the ground is breaking, so it slides down but it's the only one, look at that. Now that is the call of desperation with the cub. It's like, what are you doing, mommy? Oops, oof. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. Yeah, so we found some elephants on Butler Road. We've been with them for a while now, and there's that female at the back, the big one. She doesn't have any tusk. So it's not every day that you see an adult elephant without tusk, unfortunately. She turned her back to us now. But 
it happens sometimes that some females doesn't have any tusk. And there's still a young one quite close to us. There's a few of them around. You can see the female walking at the back there. This is the one without any tusk. It looked like they're moving away from us. There was more in the distance, so they're probably joining the rest of the herd in front there. It seems very relaxed and very quiet, like we're feeding slowly and just enjoying the morning. It is a very cool weather for them today, so that's nice. <laughs> they were just next to the car and now they just moved off. It's like we did see a few elephants already this morning, which is nice. Now we're going to drive towards Curry Main and then check Twin Dam. See if there's anything happening there. Yeah, I think because we're walking in the distance now, maybe let's continue and see if we can find anything on this road. Um, Batilda is generally around here, so we're looking for Batilda as well. Would be nice. So we had to put the cover equipment for the vehicle because of the rain, but now it seems that it's getting better, which is nice. And I can see the sky is opening a bit in front there. Still cloudy, but less, less thick. Okay, so we'll continue and see what we can find. In the meantime, we'll say that and gala. So now we've left that tranquil watering hole and we're going to make our way to the southern part of the reserve which uh, should be interesting to to explore we haven't really spent a lot of time there lately and that's mainly because we don't really understand the game movements in that part of the reserve properly we do know that bordering it there's an area with very very large open clearings so there is every chance that there's animals that might have been moving in from there onto our side. Ngala still has quite a bit of water down that side. And earlier this year, they also had a little bit of controlled burns in that area. So maybe there might be some new growth there, which would attract a lot of general game. Which in turn would attract predators. Now, from what I've noticed, at least over the last couple of years, this time of the year or the transitional periods, like either from the wet season to the dry season and then at the end of the dry season into the wet season is a time of the year that we actually see a peak in cheetah sightings. Now, we have had reports of cheetahs coming towards Ngala side over the last couple of weeks, but we haven't actually seen them on Ngala. And I think it's just a matter of them coming to scope out the areas around the watering holes where they know there might be creatures like Impala. And then of course an overcast day is always a good day for cat viewing, I think, if you find them. And there is a batalier sitting low down in a tree, which is amazing, actually. Looks 
like a juvenile batelier. You can see his feathers are quite puffed up and looks a little bit unsure. It is amazing to get such a close view of this bird. Now I can see there are some changes there starting to happen. There's a f in the face around the oof, and here it goes. What an incredible bird. So that's one thing of a day like today when it's overcast like this is the, the birds of prey or the raptors, they are generally sitting perched nearby because they're waiting either for the sun to come out, maybe to warm up their feathers and drive them out after this morning's rain. And also it's often day that you get to see some reptiles out on termite mounds or out in the open on the road which would be a good uh, drawing card for things like the brown snake eagle or the black chested snake eagle which we've been seeing quite a few of lately and then along with the birds of prey it's I always find that this weather is great for viewing cats if should you find them but um, cheetah and wild dog, if they have not had success early morning, they will tend to move a little bit later into the day and keep trying. So we're going to head down to those clearings in the southern part. I haven't heard of any signs of lion nearby. I only heard a lion calling early morning or earlier this morning. And it didn't seem to be anywhere close in this region. So welcome back with us. We just stopped here, not far from uh, Twin Dam actually. Just to listen, we're close to the Mulwati River. So we just want to sit and listen if we can hear anything. It is nice and open here. Apart for some birds we got here, but it is a very calm day, there was no wind. So I'm just going to put the handbrake on. Yeah, so I'm not sure what to do. I got a report of a leopard around, but I'm not sure where it is. So I will, after that, try to get a bit more information where is the location of that leopard, if it's on Juma or another property. <clears throat> This is where we saw also that buffalo yesterday. The, the grumpy buffalo was probably attacked by lions a few days or the night before. So he was walking towards from it again today. Start moving. See what we can find. Of
Welcome back on Bushwalk. We're still with our leadwood that has been broken off by an elephant oat. It was busy feeding on it. For those of you who are interested in how to identify this tree, it's fairly easy. It's got this grayish coloration, crocodile textured bark, which makes identification fairly easy. If we also look at the leaf structures, they're always simple. And if we look at the seed pods when the plant is producing seeds, we'll find a little four-wing pod, which is typical of combretums. There's another close uh, uh, um, really related species that are also in the combretum family, which is known as terminalias or cluster leaves. They only differ by having two wing pods. But to come back onto the tree, there's a few other things that we wanted to share with you. Oh, already mentioned how heavy and dense wood is. Because it's so dense and so heavy, it actually doesn't get fed on by anything. And termites can't break it down. It's also one of the reasons why this was a choice wood in the 1890s for the making of railway sleepers when the first two railway lines were built in the Lofeld region of South Africa. The first was designed between Pretoria as well as what was known as Lorenzo Marx in those days, today Maputo. The other one was a railway line that came through the Kruger National Park, which linked the Salati gold fields, which is quite close by to us. And quite often along some of the old railway lines, we still find the remnants of these sleepers. It's also excellent for building materials and also for mine props because the wood is so hard and durable. It also makes beautiful furniture, but you need a lot of patience and make sure that your implements is going to be sharp and that you are willing to sharpen them over and over until you've finished with your little project. Quite often we find that these trees can stand as a living tree for over a thousand years. However, those are not the oldest trees that I know. Some of the oldest trees are actually the baobabs, which we also find in the Lofeld region. And some of these specimens are well over 2,000 years in age. Once these trees have actually died, they can still stand for another hundred or so years because of a slow decay rate. And one of the few things that recycles these back as nutrients and minerals into an ecosystem is actually fire. And I've over the years seen that these trees will actually smolder for months at end and then suddenly start flaring up again after a fire has come through an area when there's sufficient amount of wind and suddenly they just burn down to powdered ash. That powdered ash is also quite often used by a number of indigenous tribes in Southern Africa for a number of dental purposes as a mouth gargle wash as well as cleaning the teeth. It was also often quite used by mixing it with milk and then using it as a whitewash in old buildings before the days of modern paints. We're going to move on. Let's go and see what Yapi is up to. So we're still driving through the clearings here on Gala where it's a very, very beautiful overcast day. And we've actually just come to have a little stop here in this clearing to see what's happening. You can see the clouds are slightly opening up now. And there's a very white sun up there, and it's quite bright actually. I was wondering if we're going to get some. If we're going to get some animals coming out into the clearings. After this morning's rain, they've been a little bit sparse. And it just feels like such a lazy morning. Which is usually exciting, because I know that that means that later in the morning things will start happening and things will get quite busy. There's a lot of birds in this area at the moment. You can hear a woodpecker far off in the distance. You can hear some African green pigeons as well. And then that nice, beautiful big knob thorn there. So 
While we sit here listening to the birds, we'll head over to Pinda with some more cats. Welcome back to Ambient Pinda. We've had a stroke of luck. One of the vehicles transporting staff across the reserve told us about two cheetah that he'd seen walking around on one of the main roads. So we and another two game drive vehicles came racing to the area and we've just managed to find the one. It looks like two big males and I know it's not the best view for now but this is for now the only view we can really get of them. In quite a tough area, they're in a big rocky section where it's quite difficult to, to move around. But yeah, there is one of the two males. And just looking through my binoculars, it looks like the, the coalition of males from the, that's again like that part of lines we saw earlier, that's dominant kind of on the southern side of the mountains. Listen to all those little birds calling, all the little rattling sticklers. They're all kind of flying around the cheetah. An alarm calling at him. Chris Afik, you're saying, yeah, you, you were hoping for cheetah. <laughs> I was also hoping for Tita, to be honest. These two males have been seen um, twice in the last two days in a big burnt area, kind of south of where they are now. And I was hoping, hoping, hoping that we would just maybe get a bit of luck and see them as they were crossing the main road, maybe patrolling back towards the western half of their territory. There's the second male, Owen. Um, the brothers here as well, just to the left of the, of the one that we're looking at. He's not as easy to see, though. And he's just, he's just to the left of that green bush in there. If you look very carefully, you just see his head moving. He's behind some sickle bush there. A pretty unusual place for Cheetah to be, up on this like rocky hillside here. It's not exactly a place where I don't think I've ever seen cheetah here before in this, on this particular little rocky area. Just thinking about it, obviously cheetah built for them being so well adapted to running at high speeds. Their legs are quite thin and their bodies are quite slender. And a, a slip off of a rock face or if they had to try and run through this area, they could very easily injure their paw, injure their leg. And then very severely, if, 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 it, if it was severe enough, it could, could impact on their ability to run, their ability to hunt, their ability to avoid predators, bigger predators. But I suppose what is good about this spot is that it does offer them quite a high vantage point from which to scan. And they can look way out into the plains off to our right, looking out for prey. AB, you commenting, you're saying that it's definitely a cat day today. AB, I think Ali said that at the start of show as well, and I think her prediction was correct, because yeah, it's been fantastic. Lots of lions and our cheetah as well. Super special. I did not manage to get a chance to look and see how full or empty the bellies of these of this cheetah of well of these cheetah were when we saw them at first. We've been trying to frantically find a position where we can actually see them from. So I'm not sure when last they have eaten, but the fact that they've been in this area for so long means that either they found something very interesting, like maybe uh, the, the, the scent left by a rival male cheetah, or maybe the scent left by a female, or 
perhaps they've found some good hunting opportunities and just haven't left the area just yet. Because normally, especially with two big male cheetah like this, because of how big their territory is, they normally don't spend too much time in one area. They've got a lot of ground to cover, a lot of a lot of territory to to to, to scent mark. And they could be in one place one afternoon and then many, many, many kilometers away the next afternoon. There's a, another coalition of two male cheetah. In fact, the rivals, the territorial neighbors of these two. And we once measured on a GPS from where we saw them the night before to where we saw them the next afternoon. If they'd walked in a straight line the whole way, um, or two straight lines, because they, they, they would have had to do a, a bit of a dog leg at some point, and it would have been 37 kilometers at bare minimum that they'd walked in a little over 24 hours. Of course, they would have stopped to rest along the way. They would have veered off of their course every now and then to go and investigate um, termite mounds and large trees on which to scent mark. It's a serious distance to cover. It's a very long way to walk. And obviously all that walking, all that scent marking, it takes its toll on these cheetahs, so... Obviously a pretty high energy demand that they have. Two big strong males like this. They'll be needing to obviously keep keep themselves fueled for those long territorial patrols. And this area we are, because of how rocky it is and the woodlands on the hillsides, it's a pretty good area for for kudu to live in. And that's definitely an animal that these two male cheetah would be looking for if they were hunting, if they were hungry. We often do see kudu in this area around these rocks. I haven't seen any for now though, but sure, it would be a pretty challenging hunt if they were to try and take the opportunity here. Just so beautiful, that male cheetah. Every time he looks at us, have a look at those eyes of his. Of course, now I say that he turns his head away from us. But when he looks back at us, look at those beautiful orange eyes of his. Oh, well, there's something that's now got his attention off to the right. Like I was saying, where he's perched, he's got a beautiful view of a kind of a grassy hillside and a, a valley full of fever trees. And I'm just looking through my binoculars from here. I can see some impala in the distance. And I wonder if that isn't maybe what he saw. There you go, that's kind of where the view that, that the cheetah have. And with those binocular vision, well that binocular vision that they've got, those eyes close together in the front of their face, they'll be able to see super well um, out into those plains there. And even though that impala is super far, I don't even know if we'd be able to pick it up with the camera. Uh, I've got no doubt that if that impala were to move, that cheetah would be able to see it. We've watched before in fact, last year, some of you may remember a mother cheetah with two cubs where we watched her climb up onto a fallen marula tree and then basically scan across the plains. And from there, we watched her body kind of like stiffen as she saw a herd of impala way, way, way in the distance. 
we thought, no, surely there's no way that she could have seen those impala. But she proceeded to walk straight in their direction and then successfully hunt one. So I'm sure sure that this male cheetah could see could see that impala from here. But whether he decides to try and go for it remains to be seen. I think the fact that they're lying down now, they may have done quite a bit of walking, even though they are, like I said, in a pretty similar area to where they were left yesterday. Look at how his body is kind of heaving. He's he's panting quite heavily. They may have done quite a bit of quite a bit of walking around. Well, it's not necessarily in a straight line, but excuse me, maybe following. Excuse me, sorry about that, everybody. Um, maybe just following a scent, or maybe they've had a couple of attempts at hunting this morning that haven't worked out. Amazing how that cheetah that's in that grass there, when it sits dead still, just super, super, super well camouflaged. And if you didn't, if it didn't move, you'd never know that it was there. But I think that Owen and I can try for a slightly better view of this cheetah for you. So we're going to try, and hopefully when you come back to us, we'll have a slightly less obscured view of that male on the right. I have a degree in environmental planning and development. My passion is outdoor classrooms. We are not only grooming the environmentalists of tomorrow, but tomorrow's leaders as well. My long-term goal is for the people of South Africa to learn how to live sustainably and to be able to look after themselves and the environment. So I hope that through environmental education, we are able to get that message to the future generation of South Africa so that they start now and can continue that good practice in the future. Environmental education is critical so that people can live sustainably in the future. That is my long-term goal. It's day one of the annual South African Guide of the Year competition. And our first foot into this competition this morning is all about tracks and signs. We're going to call you in one at a time. Uh, just look at it, the information will be there. Our five guides have been tasked by the judges at figuring out who is what, what is who, and where they go in the bush either Franklin or guinea fowl, but because of the volume of other deposits in the area, we went with guinea fowl. Yeah, we it <laughs> Detailing the surrounding that you need to look out for tracks. The details is very important. Yeah, so we <laughs> bump into the Talamatis on the road here at Mvubu, but we just moved off. So let me try if I can reposition. Uh, like we've been with them for a while now, it was quite nice. We walked quite past the car and it was quite nice to see them up close. But now they also 
moved. I'm just going to check on that block there if I can get a better view. There's another vehicle on the siding with us, so it is a bit of a tight spot. I think we went into that little drainage line there. Let's go check in the drainage line. Uh, so we were making our way actually to a leopard sighting, but we bumped into them into the road. It was quite nice. And now they decided to start moving. They are at the back there, moving, just to show you. And then we'll try to reposition. Uh, we'll have to do a bit of off-roading. OK, so I think maybe I just need to cross a little dip here. I hope we're not going to lose signal. Um, it's quite nice to see them rolling in the grass like that. Yeah, there was quite a few of them. So it's nice to see lots of them together. Looked like they were interesting in, in something. They were looking in that direction. Maybe you're asking how many years can a pride of lions last? Well, for the female, it can be a long time. For the males, they will probably lose their pride when they got too old. So it's not, it all depends, definitely. So for the males, they generally, by the age of 10, they're getting a bit old and they might be pushed out of the pride if there's Lots of competition with other males around. But, yeah, I don't have an exact number, but uh, the female uh, will stay in the pride for a long time. OK, maybe they're moving quite far now. Uh, I don't want to lose them also in that block. Maybe we'll try and follow that car that went off-road there. Okay, so we're going to try to relocate them quickly. In the meantime, we're sending you to Damon with some cheetahs. We are still with our two cheetah here at Ambion Pinda. The one that's in the thicker bush is still not very easy to see, but with a bit of a reposition, we've managed to get a slightly better view of his brother. Unfortunately, he has now lain flat. And so if you didn't know that he was there and you drove past here, you probably wouldn't see him. <laughs> Have a look at that. Look at his lovely golden coat camouflaging him into the long grass. And then just that odd movement from his ear as he flicks his ear, keeping flies away. But because of how vigilant these cheetahs will have to be because of their place in the food chain obviously being at, at risk uh, or being attacked by things like lions and leopard, they're normally pretty, pretty vigilant when they rest. So uh, I don't think it's going to be very long until he picks his head up again to kind of look around to make sure the coast is still clear. And hopefully he'll look back towards us because we've managed to get a a less obscured view of him. There we go. Just as we'd hoped. Hopefully he looks this way as well. There we go. Look at those black marks that come down the front of his face from his eye down to his mouth. Just scanning around, making sure that there's no danger. And interesting that he's facing kind of that way. He's kind of facing 
to the right and then ahead of us, and then his brother is kind of facing the opposite direction. Not easy to see, again, because he's behind the bushes, but he's kind of facing more towards us and to our left. It's almost like the two of them are like bookends facing back to back, keeping a good lookout all around themselves. And of course, for two, for two male cheetah together, or a coalition of cheetah together, the, that kind of added protection of having, having your brother there to also help you keep a lookout or listen out for danger definitely helps in terms of avoiding, avoiding other predators, but also finding food. We've just been discussing, um, as I said, these are the, do the dominant males from kind of the south and the west of the reserve. And they're still pretty young, uh, well, relatively young cheetah, in, in that they're only about four years old. So technically they haven't even, well, hypothetically, haven't even reached their full size just yet. They should, they should still have a bit of growing to do. With other males, just sat up a bit, Odie. They should still have a bit of growing to do. And they are already seriously imposing and physically like bulky, muscly cheetah. They've already, um, if I had to guess, I would say they're probably already bigger than any of the other males on the reserve. So they're seriously going to be a force to be reckoned with. I think even now already, I think if they were to come across any of the other coalitions, just in terms of their size, they would be able to, to outmuscle those, those other males. And in fact, one of the other coalitions the other day, one of the males from that coalition was discovered with quite a, quite a severe injury where he'd, he'd been attacked by, by a no doubt attacked by another coalition of male cheetah where we could see his back legs had been pretty badly um, kind of bitten and he'd been injured quite badly, like lots of scarring down his back legs and they'd even gone for his, his genitals and attacked him there. But we've, we've seen him since and he seems to be doing okay. So he obviously got away with just a couple of injuries. And that's something that these young male cheetah, for those of you who've been following this show for a while, you'll know that these young male cheetah have not had, had it easy. They've had quite a, quite a tough upbringing in that they themselves were orphaned when they were about seven months old. Their mother was killed by, by lions. But they managed to they managed to survive by you know, just by a stroke of luck. They happened to be orphaned when when the impala were all busy lambing, and so they managed to survive by catching catching little impala lambs. And in, on, along their kind of their path from then until now, as young male cheetah, they got attacked and pretty badly beaten up by by bigger coalitions or by by coalitions of bigger male cheetah. And now look what they've turned into. They've turned into these great big hulking brutes <laughs> that will no doubt do what was done to them if they come across another coalition of males. Sorry, Anna Marie, you're saying what a treat to see some cheetah. Anna Marie, I am super, super, super glad that we got to see them today. And I think for me especially, just speaking personally, these two cheetah have certainly got a firm place in my heart, just knowing their story, where they've come from and all that they've been through. And it's really good to see them looking so good and healthy and having beaten all the odds and to now be in the position that they're in. And it's been interesting. You may remember a couple of weeks ago with Grant where these cheetah were discovered quite a way out of their normal territory. And I think that's just coming with them getting bigger, getting stronger, getting more confident to kind of push the boundaries of their territory, push into other males' territories, with that, that, that confidence that comes with their, their physical size and just how imposing they are. So it's going to be very interesting to watch over the next, the next year or so to see where they, where they end up. If they do try and expand their territory a bit more, but further north. And what will happen if they do encounter one of the other coalitions of male cheetah. See that male on the right has repositioned himself ever so slightly. 
I mentioned it was quite a chilly morning this morning and quite a cold night last night. Uh, even though there was, I'd said at the end of yesterday's drive that there was a bit of cloud cover overhead, so it might not be that cold. <laughs> that cloud cover disappeared completely. And so last night was very, very, very cold. And I think just looking at where these cheetah are lying, see how they're lying kind of in the sunshine? Maybe after the cold of last night, they are just, just soaking up the sun for a bit to warm up a little before they continue with their day. They certainly haven't made it easy for us in terms of trying to see them. They're not far from us, everybody, but just the terrain is impossible. We cannot get the vehicle um, any nearer to them. But just looking at the hillside there, we might be able to get around the other side. Um, and then I think we'll be able to see their faces a bit more. We'll be a, a bit above them. So we shouldn't have our view so obscured by bushes. So we're going to try for that. Hopefully when you come back to us, we'll have a nicer view for you. So we're still with our lions and we also find dark men who's walking with with them. Uh, it's quite nice to see them mobile like that. Um, they're currently all moving on the side of the road and some of them are sitting but look like they might be interested in hunting. Now and then there's some animals catching their attention. So you will see dark men is coming as well now. On the left there, there he is. Oh, so nice to see them in the open area and mobile like that. I'm hoping now is that the buffaloes was not too far from here and maybe if they pick up some scent of buffaloes we might go in that direction. Sorry, there's a vehicle that's moving a bit forward. I think we will have to reposition as well. Yeah, let me just reposition a bit. They're still mobile on Central Road, which is very nice. So, we're still with our lions and dark men is there as well, walking in the background there, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure Morgan is going to show you dark men now. He's walking, they're all walking on, on the road, um, going towards Gary Cutline, and this is where the buffaloes was this morning, so... It's getting a bit warm, so I'm not sure for how long they will be mobile, but it's so nice to follow lions when they are mobile like that. I think I will have to go a bit forward as well. It's always great to see so many lions together. Yeah, so some of them was quite interested in hunting. Um, 
I saw a, few, a bit of blood on some of them, so maybe they, they ate, but they might still be hungry. So we have to put the end brake on. Yeah, they're walking quite far now. You can see the black patches behind the ears. This is very important for them when they hunt. Um, the reason why they can easily locate each other when they try to corner a prey. So they were all lying in the road. It was quite nice and we were seeing from the back and you could see all these black patches everywhere. Okay, I think that some of them moving quite fast forward. Uh, maybe let's continue and get to see maybe dark window a bit closer and the others as well. Oh, they all look quite wet though with the rain. Look like it is a nice lion day. Okay, so we going to stay with them. In the meantime, we'll send you to JP in Pride Lands. Welcome back on Bushwalk. We're currently walking in an area that was recently burnt. And today is at perfect weather conditions in the low fall to actually make a fire as a conservation management tool. And often you have to burn areas to remove moribund plant material, especially after very high rainfall seasons. And the fire that you would like to use in a day like this is a cool fire. And if you have low temperature and high humidity and low wind speed, that's perfect to achieve that. This type of fire will only strip the grass layer and the dead plant material and not damage the trees. In some cases, you also would like to use an incredibly hot fire, and that's generally used for removing exotic plant species. Then you will use incredibly high temperature days with high wind speed and very low humidity. So what we have over here, we were discussing earlier, was leadwood. And here we can see the ash of that leadwood. And as we mentioned, you can actually use this for whitewashing buildings, but you can also, by mixing it with milk, but you can also use the ash as cleaning your teeth it's very simple all you do simply put it over here onto your teeth and then you can use it for cleaning so in an environment like this fire as already mentioned plays a very important role but it also assists with the recycling of nutrients and minerals when our next rains come in this will then be washed into the soil and will stimulate the next growth. We often see little areas where there's green grasses that are pushing through. We're going to look a little bit further and see what else we can go and find in our little burnt area. In the meanwhile, let's hand you over to Ali and see what she is up to. Well, it is funny that we complain about the rain and the bad weather, but apparently that's when the cats do well. We've got uh, what appears to be a female leopard around here. Sadly, um, we did not find it, Aubrey did. But um, he's not sure if it's Kara or Darren when he had a better look of her also thinks it could be Tlalamba. It is possible that it's Tlalamba because we last had her with Chris a couple of days ago, not too far of this general area. So, I mean, there's a good suspicion there. I cannot tell from, from the head spots that we're looking at. So if anyone's got incredible skills for IDing leopards and wants to let us know, um, then we will believe you. She does have a kill um, on sort of hidden on a termite mound with a lot of grass, not too far from, from where we're parked now, but I think she's just gone and had enough. It's been a rainy day, so now that everything is sort of settling for the morning, she's probably going to do that, just have a bit of a snooze, and then in a little while probably head back up to the termite mound. I suspect that's how she was seen when she was on top of it. And it seems she's got a um, diker kill, if I'm not mistaken. 
We haven't been able to see the kill, but I think she's just stashed it properly and stashed herself. <laughs> and now she's sleeping. She's funny enough not too far from where we first had the lions this morning, so had the lions actually carried on coming, they could have bumped into her. But it seems like they were swayed. I think they're more interested in trying to follow where those buffalo work is. Slowly but surely they were heading in that general vicinity. Unfortunately, we had to go back to camp and then fix some electrical equipment before the car burst up in flames and we had no more signal. So at least Cedric managed to keep up with them and then just see where they go. And I'm sure probably going to get a little bit more active during the day. It is, well... It was an overcast morning, but maybe the sun will start shining. If it does start shining, there's a good chance that they'll come maybe towards the Gowrie Dam for a drink during the day. And if not, then we'll try to find them again in the afternoon, see what they do. I'm sure at some stage, Darkmane has got to find them. Because he was roaring yesterday the whole night, apparently. Also, when we had to drive back into Camp Tandy, the chef said to me, I was like, oh, there was a lion that was roaring all around camp last night. I must have, I must have been the only person that didn't hear it. <laughs> Obviously, I was tired yesterday. But I think he might be around Galago as well. So I'm sure he'll find them, meet up with them, and then reconnect. And if they carry on that way, then Tlalamba's got no fear. Well, I'm saying Tlalamba, but this is wishful thinking. This leopard that we're looking at um, won't have to worry too much. Also, it's a little diker kill at the base of what looks to be a false marula. So if she really wants to, or if there are hyenas that come around, she can just put it up that tree very quickly. There are other marula trees. But um, a kill like a diker normally wouldn't last them that long. And the good thing is as well that because it's smaller, they can just take it in their mouth and run and put it up a tree a lot easier. This is actually what a typical leopard view looks like in most places. Sleepy cat. You would never be able to tell that there was a leopard around here if someone hadn't pointed it out to us. Hi, we are Yaku and Maloni. We are from Gauteng in South Africa. We started watching Wild Earth last year during the Level 5 lockdown and we've been watching ever since. Being in nature is one of the greatest feelings. We absolutely love it. Our favourite thing about Wild Earth is that the concept is so amazing. We have the benefit of having a wild life safari in the comfort of your home, especially when you're not allowed to go out. Being part of the Wild Life Explorer program gives us a sense of giving back and contributing to nature. It just makes us feel good because we love it so much. We are so excited to be visiting Angoma. It is obviously, I think for most people, an absolute dream to visit the Masai Mara. We can't wait to go. Thank you very much for this amazing prize, Wild Earth. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. I think sometimes you need just to listen. So it's a kind of taking out all that other spirit and bring back wilderness and the healthy. Bushwalk and trek and sign. I'm sure I'm good at that. I spent most of my time on the ground since I was a young boy. So I think I'm good with that. Actually, I'm not much nervous of any category. Um, just take it as it is. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure on what the judges are looking at. So chances are 50-50 on my side. I, I, I'm not. <laughs> Obviously, when you go for a competition, you say you win. I've seen something I've never seen here before. Look at these cubs. 
one is crossing the river, it's being washed away, unfortunately, but I'm sure the mother is going to save her. Look at that! How beautiful! Look at that! One crossing, two to go. Welcome back to Ambion Pindo where Owen and I have tried to reposition on the other side of where those cheetah were. We have a slightly less obscured view, we're a little bit further away, but nice to look at this cheetah from a different angle. I suppose it gives you guys also a bit of an understanding of what we're dealing with here, <laughs> why we couldn't get closer. So we were parked kind of where that greener grass is at the top of your screen. Obviously there's that big mound of that big rocky ridge there that we couldn't quite get over. And this was the the further right cheetah from earlier, the one that was less obscured by the bushes. The slightly more orange of the two males. Quite a, a marked coloration difference between these two these two brothers, just based on their genetics. Waikishi asking how good a cheetah's hearing is. Uh, Waikishi are pretty, pretty good. They are, obviously for them, it's one of the senses that they use to help them find food and keep away from danger. So they'll be very good at listening out for the slightest sound that might give away uh, the presence of, of prey or predator, like I said earlier. And even vehicle's engine running. Like if you're following Cheetah with the, with the, with a vehicle, and of course the engine is running and it's going along and making that that churring sound, we've noticed that a cheetah, if it if it for lions and leopard, though, if they're walking through the ground, certain point engine and then respond to it. Talking about cheetahs and their hearing, we've come across this really relaxed group of zebras this morning. And away at the back, there's also some buffalo bulls laying down, not too far from water. But what a amazing scene! And I know it looks quite dry here at the moment, but this is in and amongst a silver cluster leaf forest if we have a look at those um, the zebra we can see that they're not too bothered most of them actually have their head down at the same time and just look at the ears moving even while they're feeding on the ground Imagine putting your face in long grass like that. These grasses are making quite a lot of noise, especially if you have to pluck it off with the teeth, like that zebra is doing. And you can see a combination of using the lips as well as the teeth. And the bottom incisors. They're feeding like that. They can see a little bit ahead of them. They mostly focus directly down where they can see what they're eating. So they're using their ears or their sense of hearing, which is what would aid them here. It's quite wind still this morning. So they'll be able to effectively hear anything coming from anywhere around here, especially here where it's slightly denser. And they're also up on a crest. Being raised a little bit like this, it is a good spot to be listening out for any 
any noises that might indicate something that will either be of danger or something that might draw their interest like other zebras nearby. Nancy, do zebras have a mating season? They don't really have a mating season. They do. Their births happen throughout the year. It depends on the group and when the group was formed. But they do, however, they do tend to see a incline in births, usually from around October, November onwards. And we do get to see quite a lot of zebra birds during that time. But I've also seen zebra give birth during January, February, and then I've even recently seen some very, very small babies, only a couple of months old. And how amazing is that? That zebra almost disappears in and amongst the branches. And if you squint your eyes and you had to look at the animal, you can see effectively how the markings on its coat is breaking the outline. You see those ears, the ears, it's also part of its recognizable outline. It almost disappears and you can hardly see it at all. While we have a look at the zebras busy feeding here, let's have a look at a clip about an upcoming expedition in the Maasai Mara. The Maasai Mara in Kenya is an iconic wilderness filled with life. Its inspirational beauty has captivated our hearts on Wild Earth for many years. While this season of the world's greatest migration has been missed, Wild Earth is preparing a spectacular comeback in 2022. For the first time ever, Wild Earth will be running expeditions to Kenya's Maasai Mara throughout the 2022 migration season. Hosted by David Githu and Isaac Rottich, you could be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration with the world, live on Wild Earth's daily safaris. If you're interested, then head over to our website to find out more. Well, if we had to take a guess and point where the leopard is, it would be actually really hard to point in the direction properly. She's just gone flat, as we were saying earlier. She kind of moved a little bit. We still couldn't get a good visual of her, and then she's gone back asleep. I mean, to me, it's pretty impossible to determine who it is <laughs> from the just looking at a few spots like that. I think we should just count ourselves lucky that we've got a leopard all together. Because yesterday was a bit of a droughty day in terms in terms of cats, so we didn't really have too many of them. I know Darkman was around and he gave me the run around, so, <laughs> you know, our, our balance sheet is currently in favor of Darkman. But it's fine. I found the rest of his pride before him today. So I think we can even it out um, <laughs> as a draw. <laughs> um, I think patience game for us is just to stay here and see if the leopard does decide to go back to her kill or if she's just going to sleep uh, around there. It's a good thing that she hasn't left. Um, I don't know how much of the kill there there's left. I mean, it is a small antelope, a diker, as I was saying earlier. But if she's still around here, it probably means that she's got enough in there that she doesn't want to leave it. We've also, because we've got the roof, then we've parked a little bit further away from her just to give her more space. But that didn't seem to bother her too much. She didn't seem particularly nervous of the roof. I think maybe the lions would have shown a bit more interest because sometimes because we don't drive around with the roofs all the time, then they kind of look at us and then they do a side glance and they're like, ah, doesn't matter. We're going to sit tight with the leopard, see if maybe she decides to pop her head up, but let's head over to Cedric and see if the lions are any closer to the buffalo. Yeah, our lions decided to lie down. Some of them are still moving, but probably to look for shade. It's getting quite warm here. 
Uh, you can see the sun is out, which is quite nice for for the view that, that we can get. The sun is kind of facing them, so it is quite beautiful. Sorry about that, just two lionesses there giving a bit of interaction. And there's a third one coming, might see more interaction there, some bonding, as we say. There. Not much bonding for now. No. There we go. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so it looked like we might spend the day here. There's another one coming. Sorry about that. Passing very close to us. There is a bit of blood on that lion, so we might have got some food recently. As soon as I said that we might spend the day here, they're starting to move again. Yes, I got a comment uh, saying that looks like all the cats are out today. Look that way, so leopard, cheetah, lions, how amazing is that? Yes, I was saying, as soon as we might spend the day here, <laughs> lots of them stood up and start walking on the road. So, they don't look full. Um, so they might be hungry. Or they might just go look for a better shading area. And Dark Vane is still sitting there. It's so nice to see them again. And what was nice is that they were moving quite a lot at the beginning, so sometimes you find lions which just lie down, but it was nice to see, see them move about. Dogman generally don't do much, but he is a beautiful lion. Elizabeth, you're saying you think that lions are so magical. I totally agree with you. They are beautiful, and I wish you could be on the vehicle reverse because when they walk just past you like they just did now, it is very impressive. They are very big and powerful, obviously. But it give you quite a, a sense of a power when we pass across to the vehicle. I think some impalas put at the other lions there. I might have heard of impala alarm calling. This is why all of them are looking in that direction as well now. Can you hear again? There we go. I don't know if you can hear on your side, but I think the impalas put at some of the lions. Yes, unfortunately it is a bit far, so you can't really hear it. Yes, so... I counted, I think, eight of them. Maybe nine of them, include, uh, excluding dog main. So there's quite a lot of them here. Okay, so we'll see what they do. Uh, maybe I will go check those impalas there just to see if there's a bit of action there. Um, but we will definitely stay with them until the end of the sunrise drive.
welcome back at Bushwalk. We're just busy viewing a tunnel that's been created by one of the baboon spiders. Some of you also might know them as tarantulas. So the name baboon spider, which we use in South Africa, comes from the fact that they've got hairy-like fingers and black little pads underneath the feet, just like a baboon. These are fairly primitive spiders. They're ground-dwelling spiders and don't make elaborate webs like their more highly evolved counterparts, which is known as araniomorphs. For example, golden orbweb spiders, which we often see in this area in the summer months. To come back to the baboon spiders, these little guys can range from a few centimeters in size up to 15 centimeters in size for some of the southern African species. However, one of the largest spiders that do occur in Africa is a king baboon spider, which comes forth in East Africa. Maybe you get lucky on your next trip to the Mara that you might actually see them there. I do love baboon spiders. They look incredibly intimidating. However, they don't pose much of a threat to us except for being able to provide a painful bite. Their venom is not of any medical importance to us. Often when we do see them, when they're out on the ground, they will be pretty intimidating when you try and approach them. They tend to raise on their hind legs as well as they make hissing sounds with part of their feet or jaws to intimidate you even further. These little guys will also unfortunately often get caught by wasp species and we often see spider hunting wasps dragging them out of their little burrow or capturing the males when they are moving about in search of females. They'll then lay a single egg inside there and the egg will then determine what the mass of that spider is and duplicate itself several times knowing that it's got a sufficient amount of food to produce a number of wasps inside the live host. And we have moved into the southern part of the reserve where it's very, very beautiful to see how this area looks this time of the year. You can see it's a lot more open than the rest of the reserve. It's actually some of the, the best open spaces for large groups like the buffaloes that move in this side and then there's also quite a lot of water. Now one thing that we have been noticing this morning, you can see it's like way in the distance, you can see some tree lines, that's where the dry riverbeds and the little gullies run, so that is more than likely where animals would be hiding now as the wind's picked up a little bit for the last couple of days. And what I find really amazing about this area is that way over there in the distance, there is a shambok pod. And the tree from where I can see is flowering a little bit. And it is very, very, very beautiful to see this tree flowering this time of the year already. Often some of the first trees to flower in the springtime. But while we're looking at these open clearings, we'll head over to Damon with some cheetahs. All right, so we have no cheetahs in these clearings, but at least it's a good area for it. And myself and Johan were just talking about it. Come the rains. In a few months time I think this would be the prime spot to come and look for general game around here now there's not a lot of tree cover here and I guess that's why the animals have moved into the denser parts but um, I think once we go down into the dip just 
up ahead, we might see a little bit more life. And while we do that, we'll head over to Ali with her leopardess. Well, not much happening here. <laughs> Seems like now as the sun has started to shine, uh, somebody's decided to have a cat nap. Don't blame them, it's been one of those mornings. An emotional roller coaster. <laughs> Even weather-wise, you know, we started out and it was nice and then we could see the rain and then we forgot about the rain because we saw the lions and then the rain caught up with us. And now the sun's sort of wanting to shine. So we have a bit of a debate because we've all got different weather apps. We don't know what's going to happen. It's all roads or all apps lead to towards a, a sunny afternoon, which should be quite nice. If that is the case, then I think this leopard is going to carry on sleeping around here, but maybe then later on she'll move. As I said, I don't know how much kill she's got, but hopefully enough to stick around for the afternoon. Oh, it seems like we're having a great cat morning today. So let's over to Pinda and look at their most beautiful cat. <laughs> the cheetah have left uh, the rocky section that they were lying in and they've now settled down rather ironically next to a speed limit sign. We are on the main road and unfortunately yeah, there's a vehicle that didn't see the cheetah came past. Anyway, all's okay, the cheetah seemed fine. But yeah, how, <laughs> it's not, I know it's not the nicest thing to see a, to see a, a man-made sign while you're watching a live safari, but that sign is obviously here to keep animals safe, keep people from speeding. And it, yeah, it's a pretty funny, <laughs> pretty funny thing to see uh, the fastest land animals on earth that are quite capable of exceeding that speed limit if they want to, lying right at the base of the sign. So I hope that you've all got some screenshots. I think this is... Yeah, it's quite a quite a funny little picture there. But yeah, so like you were saying earlier, obviously where those cheetah were in that rocky area, not really the 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 most ideal place for them to be, with the terrain being so uneven and so rocky. So I think they as the wind has started to pick up, I don't know if you can hear how hard the wind is blowing in the background. Look at the bushes behind this male cheetah, how they're rustling from side to side. It's gotten pretty windy here. And I think those two cheetah felt just a little bit unsafe um, in that, that very rocky area where they were. So they've moved down out of the rocks and onto the hillside where it's a bit more open and they're able to see a bit better around them. Keep a lookout for danger. And even though, like I said, this, this is a main road that kind of cuts through the reserve, because of how wide it is, it also offers these cheetah pretty, a pretty good route for them to to use as they as they as they cover their territory or they, as they send mark across their territory as they travel it's nice and wide they're able to see on both sides of the road pretty easily as they walk i still i'm still smiling and laughing at the fact that they chose they could have chosen anywhere to settle down and they chose to settle down underneath the speed limit sign And again, look at how they're kind of both looking in different directions. One looking up towards the hill, one looking down the road. Keeping a good lookout for any signs of danger. Like I said earlier, they've been they've been in this this part of the reserve for quite some time, and this is relatively far north and east for them in terms of of where around where it's. And we've currently their territorial neighbours. Um, the coalition of males, like we were saying, where the one got pretty badly injured in a fight the other day. They have just been seen deep in the heart of the territory of these two males. So if these two head back towards the core of their territory, there's going to be potential for a fight. But super, <laughs> super, 
<laughs> still can't get over the fact that they're lying under the speed limit sign. Um, nice to see them having come out out of the rocks. And nice for us to be, have been able to get you a better view. Let's send you back across to Ali. Apparently her leopardess is on the move. I mean, with that look, she does look like blah, 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 blah. Like Kla Lamba. If I am mistaken, please, James Richard, feel free to call me out and tell me. Oh, it is a very sleepy cat, whoever she is. I'm kind of hoping that she's going to get up now and then walk towards the, the termite mound. Let me just see if maybe... Can you guys see her from where you are? Can you see her from where you are? Um, if you come a little bit forward, I think it might be easier. It's she's. I have a suspicion she might be. No, because she's just been with her head in the grass, and then the kill is on the termite mound here. But I haven't seen that either. <laughs> this is a very. This is one of those leopard sightings where you have to work it. <laughs> But as I said, we get spoiled in this area, so it's good to have a reminder that these cats are actually not always easy to see. We we are very spoiled in the Sabi Sun, and I would say there are a few spots around the world that are very good for leopard with this one, and in particular this area being one of the top ones. Calling all Wild Earth Explorers. We have a new and frankly awesome travel prize for you to win. And Beyond Pin, the private game reserve, encompasses an impressive 28,000 hectares of protected wildlife land in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. As you have seen on Wild Earth, and Beyond Pinda showcases one of the continent's finest game viewing experiences and is well known for close-up sightings of the elegant yet elusive cheetah as well as the rare black rhino. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the 16th of September and you and a friend could be heading to the magnificent Pinda Mountain Lodge where you will spend three nights escaping the real world at this ultimate safari location. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. And I turned to Sean and I saw that she had this panicked look on her face. You know, either she was afraid that something had happened or she was afraid of, that she was going to miss out on something. But instead of her missing out on those lines, we drove up next to them and I switched off the car so that she could hear what was going on. Now, these lions had killed a kudu and she could hear these two cubs, both eight months old at the time, busy pushing and shoving each other out the way to get to the best parts of the meat. And the mom was lying just to the side in the shade. Now I'd known that before losing her sight, Sean probably knew what a lion looked like. But I really wanted her to know what this lion looked like. So for the first time in my guiding career, I started to describe to someone what a lion looked like. And I found that, you know, I started to notice things in that lion that I'd never seen before. Oh, cheeky, that was a brave decision. Amber Eyes is... Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is so magic. That was absolutely wonderful. Amber Eyes just gave that cub an enormous hug. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth. What a beautiful lion, dark man. Always very nice to see him with his head up. Most of our lions left us, so there's only dogmen and a young male around us. The others walked into the block toward the river, which is riverbed, which is quite close to us. But at least these two was kind enough to stay with us.
what a very nice morning. So nice to see so different, so many different cats. But also some elephant was nice as well. I'm very happy I saw the talamatis again and dog man. Hopefully they will stay around Juma. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going in, in quite the same direction of the buffaloes. Okay, so we'll wait here and see what we do. In the meantime, we'll send you to Ali with the leopardess. Well, I want to say that this leopard actually belongs to the grass because <laughs> we can't see. We just see a few spots here and there. But um, thank you to everyone that helped us identify and confirm that she is Tlalamba. Good to catch up with her. And funny enough, yesterday I was chatting to Tristan trying to get some intel and I was like, okay, we just last saw her here. Where do you think she could be going? And then he, he also said, him, oh, she must be around Galago and Boo. She was like, go check that area. She likes it there. Well, clearly she does because <laughs> there she is. So um, hopefully she'll eventually or she'll be here this afternoon. It would be quite nice if we had the lions on the one side and then the leopard on the other side. Couldn't really ask for more. And then if we get um, Pinda with the cheetahs in there and then maybe we'll get Ngala with wild dogs and we're done. What else do we need? It's pretty much, pretty much all we could uh, hope for, uh, for an afternoon safari. Now watch, I've just jinxed all of us, it'll be nothing. <laughs> no, no. Hopefully not, I joke. Yeah, I think she's done for the day. Maybe she actually hunted this diker in the morning and I think she's pretty much done. Alrighty, from a beautiful cat to the next, um, let's head over to Pinda. It certainly has been a, a big cat-filled day. Lions and leopard and cheetah across all the different locations. And yeah, the two male cheetah here are still <laughs> sitting at, this, at the speed limit sign. And look how the one brother has crossed his paws over. It's almost as if he's policing the speed limit sign, watching vehicles coming past. Gloating. <laughs> uh, you cars have to keep to the speed limit, we don't have to. And they've got such a beautiful spot here, slightly elevated so that they can look down into the valley, keep an eye out for any signs of prey. Um, and then I think a little bit later on they'll start to move. I'm gonna, I would imagine probably using the road to head a bit further down into the valley and then more than likely start making their way back into the heart of their territory. It's been a little while since they've been there, so they want to keep that area marked and keep other males out. And who knows if they'll meet up with their territorial rivals when they get there. But it's been a lovely morning here at Ambient Pinda. It's warmed up a little bit, even though the wind has picked up. And we've had a had a super awesome morning with lions and cheetah. We hope that you've all enjoyed the drive as much as we as much as we have. And we look forward to welcoming you all back onto the vehicle for the sunset safari this afternoon. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve. We're currently looking at the landscape. Not much is happening around us here. Uh, on our side here, Eli and I will bubble on Juma, but we will be reporting live on, from all our locations, which is great. Hopefully we'll be able to show you some great sighting. So please jump on board and welcome to your very own live safari from the African wild. Yes, 
so we're still sitting here at Juma, uh, looking at the landscape. It is cloudy this afternoon, but it is a nice cool weather, so that can be nice for today. My name is Cedric and I have Darren on camera with me this afternoon. Yeah, so I was saying on our plan for us it's to bumble around, see what we can find and maybe do some birding again. We get some great bird this morning, so why not continue that? Um, yeah, so we're currently on Philemon's cut line. We left camp a little bit early to see if we can find anything, but no luck yet. But it is very early still. So I think what we will do on our side now, it's... I did one part of Zoe's road, I would like to do the other part now. 